Okay. All right, everyone. Well, good evening. Welcome to Uncharted ter Territories, Reaching New Markets and Customers. Before we get started, I'd like to do a quick introduction to Start Out. Uh, for those of you that have never heard of Start Out, you're very new to this. Uh, Start Out is a U.S.-based nonprofit organization that focuses on supporting LGBTQ plus entrepreneurs and startup founders. Our mission is to increase the number, diversity, and the impact of LGBTQ entrepreneurs, and also to amplify their stories and drive the economic empowerment of the queer community. Start Out's Growth Lab is the world's largest supporting LGBTQ entrepreneur lab with 56 graduate companies that have raised $756 million in funding so far and have created 3,650 3, plus new jobs. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge our sponsors. We have many sponsors from notable Fortune 500 companies to community banks. We would like to thank all of our sponsors for supporting all of our events, including this event tonight. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce myself and then call on the moderators for tonight's panel. I am Romika Devi. I am the co-chair for the Start Out's Growth Stage. And I am also the founder of Next Level Sobriety. I help sober professionals get unstuck, find their purpose after addiction and move forward. Now I'd like to hand it off to James for his introduction. Hi, my name is James Knesik. Um, I'm the founder of By the Job Inc. and also co-chair with Ramika on the uh, growth programming board for Start Out. Um, and uh, I'll turn it over to Alex for his introduction. Hello, I'm Alex. Um, Alex Lee, I'm, I work at the Wies Institute, which is a part of Harvard in business development. And I'm also on the growth board with Ramika and James. All right, so tonight's topic um, is should be a great interest to a lot of companies that are looking to expand globally. Um, we have a panel of some wonderful experts that will be joining us. Um, I did want to talk briefly about what we'll be talking about, but um, it's interesting to note that, you know, from our perspective, and um, Ethan and uh, Remy reminded me of this, from our perspective, generally start out is kind of a U.S. domestic based organization, and it focuses primarily right now on a lot of U.S. domestic founders and businesses. Um, but when you look at it from the other side, we've actually got our panelists um, who experience it from the other side, from an outside market from the U.S. who started or grown in a foreign market to a U.S.-based perspective into the markets that are domestic here. So when we say domestic market, it's domestic for whoever that person is. So like Amre is in the Philippines, her business is domestic to the Philippines. Um, and we've got uh, Remy, whose business started predominantly kind of in the, in the European markets and then branched over here to Central and South America. So um, we'll be hearing a little bit more from those perspectives as well in terms of trying to break into a U.S. domestic market from their original domestic markets um, worldwide. Um, but when we talk about globalizing, we're really talking about expanding your business. And that all that is all part and parcel with growth for any business. Um, one of those one of those big expansion opportunities, of course, is you grow a certain level domestically and then you start to branch out internationally to try to exploit new markets and find new uh, market segments and um, begin to grow your demographic a little bit further in your brand a little bit further beyond your borders. Um, obviously, the um, advantages or motivations to growing internationally are going to be your revenue potential. Um, it could also be cost efficiencies that you can gain by producing internationally um, or non-domestically or, you know, labor costs for doing certain things that you may have been doing domestically that you can no longer be competitive from a pricing or labor standpoint. Um, some of the well-known barriers, of course, that we heard mentioned when we pre-interviewed every one of our panelists was um, issues with legal. There could be issues with cultural barriers that have to be overcome. You could also have financial barriers that are new to a particular market or even managing a workday across multiple time zones. Um, as it stands, when we introduce our panelists, I would like each of them to tell where they're currently 
um, connecting from. And it'll give you kind of a feel for the globalization of their businesses as well as their experience. So with that, we will go ahead and start with Ethan and have him introduce himself and where he's currently uh, talking to us from and, and we'll go from there. Ethan. Thank you so much, James, and greetings from Tunis, Tunisia. Uh, my name is Ethan Mayers. I was in finance and private equity before becoming a startup entrepreneur three times. I then became a CEO times twice um, of corporate innovation cells. I've run companies on three different continents, and for the last couple of years, I've been spending my time supporting founders within a variety of roles from as an advisor, fractional executive, and investor. Um, these days, I also help the Swiss government do economic development in several countries around the world, supporting uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems, giving back to the community that's given me so much. And recently, just last month, I released my first book called The Agile Shepherd, all about how to create, define, and sustain innovation. Thank you, Ethan. Um, Oscar. Hello, everyone. My name is Oscar Pedroso. I'm the founder and CEO of Thimble.io, calling in from Buffalo, New York. Uh, we're an education technology company that provides a K-12 curriculum to schools uh, to teach students 21st century skills such as robotics, coding, cybersecurity, AI, and a lot more. Um, we do most of our business here in the U.S., um, but we also uh, have established partnerships abroad such as Kenya, India, Bangladesh, Puerto Rico, Peru, um, and more. Uh, before this, I worked as a math teacher working in uh, several inner city schools and uh, been tinkering with electronics since I was a little kid. So education is a big passion for me and uh, love the work that I do. So looking forward to being part of the panel. Thank you, Oscar. Remy. Hi, I'm Remy. I'm French, as you can hear, uh, based in Mexico City for the past 10 years. Um, started my career at LVMH, then at L'Oreal. Uh, then I launched a uh, I, I moved right around, living in the US, in Brazil, in Italy, in the UK, and now in Mexico for the past 10 years. Uh, my first uh, company as founder with a successful exit was a copycat of Trader Joe's in Mexico. For those who live in the US or know, Trader Joe's has a pretty interesting, better for you, better for the planet product as a better price. And I launched two years ago, Saredi Saredi, with the ambition and the vision to be the first ever affordable luxury brand for fashion and cosmetics focusing on the Hispanic Gen Z. We are the first brand ever that focuses on that pretty unique demographic. It's a $50 billion market that is quite untapped. And uh, we have only two years, but we are probably already the number one in online sales in Mexico as premium Mexican brand. Wow. Thank you, Remy. And Amri. Hello, good evening and good morning, everyone. I'm Amri Dizon calling from Manila, Philippines. I'm the founder of Vital Strats Creative Solutions, a company that I'm proud to say is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. Um, for over two decades, we've been dedicated to providing innovative and strategic creative solutions that empower businesses to connect with their audiences effectively. Um, we specialize in creating visual communications from branding and design to digital marketing and audiovisual productions. Um, our goal is to not just reach audiences, but to resonate with them. And uh, we foster engagement through creativity and strategic insight. Um, it's a privilege to be among fellow professionals who share a passion for exploring uh, global markets. Uh, my journey in international business has led to building customer relationships across um, USA, Canada, Singapore, and Australia. And uh, I look forward to exchanging insights and learning together as we discuss this exciting world of global expansion. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. Thank you, Omri. So um, we'll start off with then our first question. Um, I am going to do a stop share on this um, for now um, to make sure that we can maximize the screen when everyone is talking. Um, our first question is pretty much to, as an open panel question. So any of the panelists can answer it. Um, obviously expanding a company into a new market um, can be quite challenging, even if it's done domestically. But obviously when you face a global challenge, there's a whole new set of circumstances that go along with that expansion. 
So any one of you, what were some of the unexpected challenges you may have encountered with a global expansion effort and what countries were those global expansion efforts targeted for? So any one of you who may have an idea or an insight about a specific challenge for moving into a new country. Don't everyone talk at once now. <laughs> I'll start with some basic stuff, which um, is, is things that a lot of entrepreneurs don't, don't um, get into because um, and I'll leave that for some of the other people to talk about the business development and the growth. But a lot of legal and financial issues with actually starting a company, getting the right cap table set up, equity structure and subsidiary structure. One time we were doing a project in Myanmar, for example, and had to set up a holding company in Singapore that was registered to a UK company in order to funnel, funnel funds in and out of Myanmar. These kind of things can get a little more complicated and can actually cost significant amounts of money. Uh, in one example, I also had a company that I was supporting in Bangladesh who wanted to make themselves um, attractive for global investments. One thing to let you know about global investments is there's only about 10 to 12 countries in the world that you can register in that will make you attractive to global investors. I'm sorry to say, but it's the reality. And, and they include countries like France, UK, Germany, um, U.S., Singapore, it was only a handful. And so the country in Bangladesh wanted to re-register in Singapore. It ended up costing over 50,000 U.S. dollars in order to play around and a couple more thousand dollars in legal cost because they had to clean up the cap table as well. So one of the things is when you're expanding to other markets, you do need the legal protections of opening up a subsidiary. And if you do have a problem with where you're currently incorporated or your current cap table structure, you may face additional financial and other legal and regulatory rules. Cool. Remy, I know you had an opinion on this when we pre-interviewed you. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I just think that entering a new market has to be first something that you, you make sure you test the data, you maybe test the market with some pilot, but entering a new market can definitely be such a challenge that can kill your own company. Uh, for example, today as a, leader in Mexico and think about how we can grow the biggest Hispanic Gen Z market for us is the US. However, there's so many uh, entry barriers, so much of a, the, such a hard and complicated competition and uh, so much investment we have to put on the table. We are talking about like three to $5 million minimum to kind of replicate what we did 100% bootstrap. Meaning like we reach our first million dollars in sales with no money from anyone. We then start raising a pre-seed round that we are just closing right now, by the way. But um, what I would say is that, and that's what we want to show to invest investors right now, is that this year in 2024, before we raise a $5 million round, focusing on expanding to the US and taking a risk, diluting all of our equity for that, we want to show some kind of traction and some kind of data that demonstrate that this is the right choice. Because if we don't, if we do not, do it well we do it we, we might just uh burn in the middle so yeah that's i don't know if you want me to get more into it there but i just would like to say that entering a new market is not always the best idea maybe your local market your domestic market has way more to offer before you think about the rest of the world even though as ambitious entrepreneurs we all should aim uh to the world and and and, and to expand everywhere excellent answer Okay, Alex has the next question. Yeah, kind of, um, you know, branching off the question that, you know, James had proposed, this is going to be another um, open ended question. Um, as founders and leaders of your own respective organizations, have you guys had to think about, you know, adjustments to your schedule, your work day, and, you know, travel, or including more, you know, cultural, um, um, you know, environment for your um, international workforce that might not be based in your primary location? So I, mean, I guess I'll start. I, I work across pretty much every time zone, considering the companies I support all the way um, go 13 hours ahead to all the way back behind in Hawaii. Um, so when done correctly, this is a magic. This is absolute magic because, you know, sitting here in, in New York, which is kind of sort of actually centrally located among a lot of time zones, when you do it right, you can basically go to sleep at night and then wake up and magically work is done, right? That's that's actually the dream of it. 
Um, the reality is a little harder than that, right? So the reality is calls like right now it's uh, one seventeen a.m. This is not unusual. Uh, this is not unusual. I'm having calls until eleven o'clock at night. Sometimes I'm waking up at five in the morning. Um, you know, when you open a market or when you connect with another culture, you need to be respectful. A lot of times the, cult the culture is made bend to you and try to adjust to your schedule, but that's not the right thing to do. You should bend to their schedule as well, which requires early nights and uh, early mornings and late nights. Um, so it is a, a lot different. Communication is also difficult because it's by definition an asynchronous remote environment. And that requires, in many cases, a lot of over communication. So, yes, it's magical when you go to sleep and wake up and work's done, but that's because you've probably built up a relationship, built up a rapport, and actually do a really, really good job of identifying exactly what needs to be done. And about Ethan cultural part and other chance, I didn't even wear, but you know, like start working in Italy and in the UK or Brazil versus Mexico versus the US, because I have to say, as a French in the US, The, the, it was kind of a shock. Uh, you know, French are hysterical and insane and never happy, but and American are quite different. Anyway, uh, what I want to say is that sometimes, even when you want the, the cultural part and the emotional part of the country is key. I remember that call when I was talking to investors and she talked about basic stuff. And she said, so that is how much does it cost in like Mexican dollars? You know, like, It seems nothing. When we talk about Mexican dollars, and you didn't even do your homework to know that we are talking about pesos mexicanos, you know, like Mexican pesos. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it shows how pretentious you might be because dollars, it's, it's a money in a country that is the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk and remember, yeah, can you compare that between Brazilian dollars and Mexican dollars? And I was Actually, people tweak it very badly because it shows that you had no idea of what you're talking, even though it's true that in Mexico and, and, and in Mexico and Brazil, we use the same sign. So yeah. that may be confusing, but that's not Mexico. I don't know. I just wanted to give this moment because I always remember how it can how we can need to make sure that especially starting discussion, we don't want to offend anyone. And I think especially as a French, people can be easily offended uh, when you start talking to people like us. And I just want to add real, something real quick to that, Remy. So one of the things that I've trained myself on now, it's second nature, but it's really important when you globalize is to be really specific in all of your communications. So for example, when I'm confirming a meeting, um, yeah, sometimes I'll get lazy, but I'll always say something like 10 a.m. Eastern time zone. Yeah. Or when I specify an amount, I'll say 100 US dollars, right? So, you know, I, I try like the best of them to try to, to look at their time zone. Sometimes I don't. But as long as I'm that specific, then at least we have a basis of shared understanding and communication. And now it's become second nature. So if you're going to globalize, you have to make sure to put those little details in at every step of the way, yeah. um, because that's the only way you're going to minimize misunderstandings. Correct. Yeah, I'll also add too, if you're going to go global, I mean, we, we have and uh, you sort of have to be prepared to jump right in. Um, you know, I've been in the U.S taking calls at 2, 3 a.m. I've also been in India taking calls at 2, 3 a.m. So it's, it's one of those things um, that needs to happen. But we're at a point now, too, where we have a customer support team. We're on a rotating schedule. So um, for folks in the U.S., they're, they have their shifts during the day here. And then we also have a team in India that has a, their shifts while we're sleeping. So when we, gave up, when we wake up, there's a handoff to the team here and vice versa. So... It takes a while to get to that point, but it's a, um, as Ethan was saying, it's a beautiful thing when it happens. So Oscar and Ethan, I know there were some mentions, you know, during the pre-interview about specific in-touch, in-person meetings with your offshore teams or your offshore clientele and how important that is to bridge that gap and not to just send emails and, and have kind of like virtual meetings and just total hands off. Um, I know, Ethan, you said that was a very important aspect of making sure that you're staying in touch and staying in tune with extending your brand strategy and your company culture to any of those foreign markets. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so this is kind of two keys, right? So I, I've done it both ways, uh, extending a company so you open up a new market and you're going to have a new country manager and marketing team and what have you. You also have um, offshore components of a team. So I deal with a lot of software development. So you have software developers in India, 
or um, Romania or in Serbia where I've worked in a lot. I'll tell you, there's a couple, there's a couple things you have to understand. Like, first of all, um, you know, it, it's not an offshore team. It's an extension. It's a partnership. And as such, you absolutely need to have a very, very strong leader in that country leading your team that you have a very, very good and solid relationship with. Number two, nothing, uh, you know, mistakes, the um, nothing takes place of in-person meetings. Uh, preferably at least once a quarter, at least twice a year. Um, you know, the, the more that you're there, the better it is. If you can pull off once a month, once every other month, even better, because it's not just, it's about transferring the culture of the business. It's about making sure there's alignment. You stay away too long and, and you'll have um, um, drifts that are far away, you know, and, 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 and culture, and business culture is not just how hard we work. It's how we communicate. It's how we talk to one another. It's also how we solve problems. It's also introducing key personnel so that people know who to email and who to contact and who to text in the right message you, uh, showing up is half the battle and if you're considering an extension into uh, another country either for uh, a new market or for an extension of your team understand the cost of that connection you are now going to be a global executive and you are now going to be should plan on the minimal quarterly visits to these teams that are so vital to your organization and it just has to be done and you should also budget um uh, money for once a year, possibly once every other year, of bringing the team to corporate headquarters too. You can't underestimate the power of that and transference of culture and being able to really move forward at a higher velocity. Excellent. And that kind of brings us to our next question. Um, Oscar, you had mentioned, you know, kind of getting a, uh, a slower start in India than you had wanted to, and then you had to switch gears. Um, and part of that was kind of building that in-country presence and then that trusting relationship with a new set of in-country representatives to, to um, manage your product. Tell us a little bit about that, Oscar. Yeah, for us, it was somewhat accidental. It wasn't really, so I'll use India as an example because um, currently in about 25 schools in India. And uh, I wasn't really thinking about India until um, I brought on board our Chief Revenue Officer, who's now our co-CEO, Darati, she's amazing, and uh, she's from Mumbai, so she has a very good, I mean, she's from there, right, so she understands how business gets done, she knows the culture, she knows the language, she knows several languages um, that are spoken in India, so having that advantage has been super helpful uh, for, for me to see that the business opportunity and why we should be there, um, being there in person, obviously, uh, you know, I was there three times last year and it was important for me to be there. And every time I was there, it was very different. First time I sort of took it all in. Second time I sort of got the hang of it and jet lag didn't get the best of me as it did the first time. And the third time I was actually doing demos and presentations and training. Um, that all takes a lot of time, but I think being there, you can't beat there. You can't beat being there in person, right? That's necessary, but obviously to keep it sustainable, you're going to have to have some boots on the ground to assist with that because it is a heavy lift. I mean, it's a 16 hour flight, right? I mean, there's an adjustment that that needs to happen um, when you're there and back. Um, the good thing is that Darty has been able to corral a group of people there that are super passionate about our mission. And and so that has very much helped how we coordinate and do business in several parts in India that I don't think would happen, you know, even if it was just me flying back and forth, it's just, it would just burn us out entirely. So having that plan of, of having people there that believe in the cause and are essentially doing what our counterparts here in the U S are doing, except they're there. Um, it's totally different. The, the, the only difference is they, they know the language, they know the culture, they know how business gets conducted and it's, it's a constant learning experience. So, um, and, and the thing is, that's going to be the same thing in any country. So in Kenya, in Bangladesh, it's all been very different. Um, some similarities, obviously, Bangladesh with India, um, even Kenya for that matter. Cool. Yeah. Amri, do you have some comments about this? In our case, um, we, we had a physical office pre-pandemic. And then during the pandemic, we had to go remote first. And then we realized that, oh, it, it's more sustainable and we can attract more um, global 
um, global recruits, global <laughs> global um, clients this way. So we have um, shifted to remote first. Um, the challenges that we have is mostly um, time zone differences and adjusting to different work cultures. Um, since we are a marketing and creative services company, we don't have any physical products. Everything is digital. So I guess it's much easier um, for a business model um, like ours. Um, since we create marketing strategies and creative services for businesses abroad, I guess the main challenge would be getting to know their market, their competition, um, the, the platforms that they use are also different from the local market. Like for example, here in the Philippines, Facebook is number one, um, but um, abroad, um, different um, customers have different customer journeys and they have, um, they use different platforms. So it entails a lot of market research. Um, it's um, also very important to have solid, solid processes. Um, we have kickoff meetings with uh, clients and we walk them through each and every milestone for the process of our many different customized services. So we're always aligned. And um, um, it's important to have all the digital channels um, work for you so that when they inquire, um, all the information um, about the services, the process, et cetera, would, would, um, they, they already have knowledge about it and there would be uh, more deeper conversations when we have our virtual meetings. So it's easier for them to decide and be ready to, to engage with us. Um, the, the product market fit establishing that is, um, is, uh, is key to us. Excellent. I think that kind of ties into, in general, um, you know, you're always going to face challenges to whatever market, but I think picking the correct uh, first market to go after is key. Um, so kind of leading off that, I know Remy, you had mentioned, um, you know, the U.S. as being your next market, um, you know, because of the significant revenue potential, but, you know, there are certain barriers um, for your business in going there. Um, can you tell us a little bit uh, more about that journey, um, you know, why the U.S. is a good fit and some of the barriers that you kind of face along the way? I mean, we, we, we believe the data, I mean, for now, the data shows that this market makes a lot of sense because of the market size, because of the lack of offer, because of the high demand. Uh, but for now, before I jump into the U.S. and raise a proper and dedicated round for that, we are testing the testing any channel because we are an omnichannel company selling both online offline through wholesale and through direct to consumer stores so even though the data show it i don't know if it's the right fit and the the pilot we'll do this year we're going to do a pilot testing or make a product with amazon us we are going to do a pop-up store to test retail with the chain of a mall called simon in miami miami being the main region, one of the biggest region for Hispanics uh, in Hispanic Gen Z's. And uh, since my company is a celebrity backed brand, uh, my co-founder and creative director is one of the biggest influencers in Mexico. Uh, we are testing to replicate that strategy, meaning to replicate it, having on board the top celebrities, like, I don't know, a Maruma, a Karo G, like, you know, like a list celebrity that resonate with this agency before having them on board and giving them equity. We are testing this year collabs with artists in the US that are Hispanics and that resonate with US. So about that at that point, even though the data shows it, in my case, my best go to market is to spend a year testing the market with things that are not financially uh, resource wise too too much of an of a, of an investment, but that will give me clear data to then follow what Ethan was saying, like the whole team was saying, like where you jump into it and you move there. And we were thinking that to, to for the US, we were thinking that we move the half of the team and one of the co-founders would move there. So like we will do it the proper way. Yeah. What might happen is that we realize that US is way too risky, way too complicated. And if it's the case, 
maybe we'll just expand to Colombia or to Argentina that have a smaller opportunity from a revenue standpoint, but it can be maybe easier to enter where we can bootstrap something and not risk the future of the whole organization. I think you said something about maybe the FDA being an issue as well, getting your product approved. Yeah, I mean, in that case, I'm a, I'm a direct to consumer cosmetics and fashion brands. And it's true that um, going back to a little bit was uh, Ethan Nelska was mentioning that you better do your homework from a legal and a regulatory affairs standpoint, because starting that starting with exporting your product in to the market can just fuck up your PNL just because of some customs clearance and customs taxes that you didn't expect. Um, so yeah, in our case also, we are like flipping the company because if we grow in the US, we need money from US investors to get money from US investors. Either you are a US LLC, the holding is a US LLC or it's a Cayman sandwich structure where you have a Cayman that owns an LLC that owns all of the operating subsidiaries. I just drop names. It feels that I know something, but I don't know anything. I and mean, it's really like complicated, you know, investor slash legal slash tax mechanism that make the most sense for you. Because if you do it well at first, once your company is a success, you might, you might just uh, be, you might just get some surprises and some crazy taxes and stuff. So yeah, long story short, while you test the market with pilots like myself, just take a year to understand or a month or like whatever you need to understand everything related to legal, uh, fiscal and regulatory affairs. If your product is related to food or cosmetics, FDA being very weird on some stuff, very flexible and agile and on other stuff. But like just to give you an example on one of the biggest cosmetic market, which is sunscreen, US is the only country in the world where 95% of the sunscreen are not allowed because there's some weird thing that happened a thousand years ago where the FDA decided that any synthetical sunscreen protection was not allowed. That's why any big brand like La Roche-Posay, like L'Oreal has to produce locally mineral sunscreen, what the rest of the world doesn't really use mineral sunscreen, just because for some reason they have applied these rules a thousand years ago. So yeah, be careful. And just to add just one quick thing to that, Remy, I mean, you couldn't be more right. So there are cases in manufacturing, for example, uh, and, and everything specific to whatever you're going through, but there are cases in manufacturing, for instance, that people have figured out if you send things in two boxes, you send that something with just a couple screws missing, and then you put the screws in, you know, in your country of location, those materials would be counted as raw materials and not a finished product. And you're finishing product in country and the taxes would be different. I mean, it's a lot of things like that, that matter. And then there are other places, other people um, that will just source raw materials from uh, change their entire supply chain based on the need, necessity and tax structure. So to, to Remy's point, just like tripling down on it, it may have a profound effect on your P&L. Not always bad. In some cases, it could be good, but it will have an absolute dramatic effect. And the worst thing you want, and to, to triple down on Remy's point, is to be surprised. Like if, if you're going into a country and surprised at the effect that you're having on a PL, you're not doing a good job managing the business. And to your point, I think surprise will help will happen anyway. So you better like well, backing up as much as you can because I, I remember like we did a wholesale order in a New York store. They ordered a mix of product bags and stuff like Everything fashion accessories, like, again, we are not chewing cancer. I'm, I sell bags made in cactus leather, so it's fun and stuff, but long story. Like, they ordered, like, maybe, like, what? Five pairs of sunglasses. The whole shipment was uh, rejected, destroyed at customs in New York because they considered in the U.S. that a, a, sunglass, a sunglass is a medical device. I have no ambition to sell prescripted sunglasses but it was considered a medical device. And obviously I had no permit to sell medical device. And if your manufacturer had a lot of tests and drop tests and whatever, which is not something impossible to get, honestly, but we didn't get it on time because we didn't know. Basically I lost my whole, I lost the client. I lost the whole much, I, I, I lost everything else, everything else sense. So yeah, a surprise will happen. So better to back them, back them up beforehand. 
So custom seized it and destroyed it just because they said that yeah. eyeglasses were. But don't be better. scared too. Like sometimes you know what I feel also, James, is that we kind of like are scaring everyone. Yeah. Don't be scared, but just test small thing. You know, like don't go all in because you need to learn first and you need to be ready to learn. If you're not ready to learn or you don't have time, maybe focus on your domestic market first. But like, I don't want like to give that impression that global expansion is a crazy thing. Like just don't go outside of your, of your home anymore. Like it is still magical. Yep. There's always risk. Um, like you said, you know, knowing, knowing when to go out there and knowing what to look for and knowing how to test is, is going to be key. Um, Ethan, I know you had mentioned a little bit about um, the timing for expansion globally and the ideas around that. And you said some of it, it's ego driven um, and it doesn't have a whole lot of basis or a whole lot of fun. It doesn't make a whole lot of financial sense, but it's just that, you know, some new company owner wants to put global behind the name of their company. Tell us a little bit about your opinion on that. Yeah, so you know, uh, uh, you guys have heard this like the new layoff term is RIF, RIF, reduction in force. Uh, I've had to do that more than once at companies that have expanded too fast. So I'll kind of, I'll kind of break it down for you. So, so you're thinking about expanding globally, and I'm going to give you three scenarios to consider, right? So I'm, I'm making a couple of assumptions now. So this is a very nuanced conversation. So I'm going to make the following assumptions. I'm going to make an assumption that you currently have a business, and you're operating somewhere, you're operating in one market, because there's plenty of times where that might not be the case. But let's go with that scenario, right? You've got three options, that is three scenarios, and I'll play out the three scenarios for you. Uh, scenario one, you're not doing well in your domestic market. Scenario two, you're doing okay in your domestic market. Scenario three, you're crushing it in your domestic market. Now, each of those three have very different outcomes, right? So scenario one, you're not doing well in your test market, in your domestic market. Do you know enough of why you're not doing well? In plenty of cases, I have seen companies that their you know, first market was not the right market for their product and they have to go somewhere else. And that was a full commitment. And in some cases, that meant a full commitment, including the founding team relocating to the new co country where that was a better market. I want to be very clear about what that scenario looks like. Of course, you might not be doing well in your domestic market because you failed in marketing or other things have occurred. So you really need to be understand and clear and data driven of why you're failing. Let's say you're doing only moderately well in your in your um, in your domestic market. What's interesting about moderately well now, just for perspective and nuance, I generally deal with software more than um, hard goods, and I also deal with companies that are trying to go global and become, let's say, unicorns and big companies. That's the mindset that I go in. Right? There's a huge danger in doing only okay in your um, domestic market. And that's the danger of actually just running and becoming a small business. You know, I've seen lots of entrepreneurs that had an ambition to run a billion dollar global empire. They got to like a million dollars in revenue and they stalled out because they got so absorbed with managing the million dollar business that they could no longer run tests, do experiments or do anything else to expand the business. Before they know it, they went through investor cash and they, you know, had to force the break even and they couldn't do anything else. So in that particular scenario, um, sometimes actually going global might actually do you some good in some scenarios and cases, um, because you're sitting there, don't forget why you started the business in the first place and to have the ambitions that you want. Now, if you're crushing it in your market, which is great, congratulations, that brings a different set of problems because um, it is the ego of the entrepreneur that might assume that whatever they did in one market will easily transferably work in another market and in many cases, that's simply not true. Of course, that can be true sometimes for some products and some services, but that's not always true. And I think everything that this panel was talking about, which is experiments and such, are the right way to go. The key is do not go into a global expansion simply because you think it will be cool, because you think it would be um, better to attract investors by having a market. The intricacies, complexities, and cost of entering the global market are high. There are plenty of reasons to do it. It starts with the ambition of the company and the hard data that supports the decision to go into a market, as well as the data that you have from your existing market and the specific reasons of why you want to, want to enter into a market. So at the end of the day, it's about intention. Make sure that intention aligns with the data that you have to support to make an informed decision. Because what you're really doing, and I think Remy summed it up best, is you're making a bet. It's a gamble. If Remy goes to the U.S., it's a gamble. R Remy goes to Colombia, it's a gamble. Yeah. If Remy spends all of his money staying in Mexico, it's a gamble. Understand entrepreneurship at the end of the day 
a little bit of a gamble. I remember flying into Las Vegas once and somebody said, mm -hmm. you, I said only with my businesses because it is a bet and it is a gamble. And the question is the successful entrepreneur is able to put their ego aside and make a data-driven informed decision using a combination of intuition, yeah. the data that they have, and 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 um, the results of tests and experiments they were capable and able to run. In the basic, Amrei, you had a comment. I always do so just a quick joke. I sure. always do about that. It's it's like a bad relationship. Don't do a kid to save a marriage. Is the same. <laughs> You're like don't uh, don't don't go don't expand just because you want to save or do something mm -hmm. or your ego or like like thinking thoroughly before you you take any any life-changing uh, decision oh yes um to add to that um uh, i consider three things because it entails some changes into the business model first is your desirability as a business of course you would have to change your value proposition across other um, geographical markets um, you have to have uh, a unique value proposition that is um, apt for that new market. And the channels uh, where you communicate with your audiences would also change. Um, you have to consider that. How are you going to change your channels? And um, the market segments. Um, in our case, uh, we don't just look at the demographics and the ge geographical uh, markets. We have needs-based um, market segmentation. Like For example, um, businesses who would like to outsource or businesses who would like to have an expanded creative team. So um, market segments would definitely change and you have to be desirable in terms of in terms of the value that you offer in the, the channels you are present and the segments that you cater to. But that's just the first thing. Second thing is, um, is it feasible to operate in these new markets? Do you have the right um, resources? Um, are you going to have to change um, or um, seek for new partners. Of course, your key activities and processes would also change. Um, so you have to take a look into the feasibility of your operations and its impact to your costs. So segueing that to the viability, is it going to be profitable for you? It, would it result, result to more revenue? Um, it has to be viable. Uh, you have to look at the changes in your cost structures if there would be more cost efficiencies, well and good, you'll have more profits. Um, will it bring you more revenue streams? Um, you have to consider that. So desirability, feasibility, and viability, and a complete change to your business model if you're catering to new markets. Excellent. Okay, I think and Alex. Talking next... about um, the business model, Amre, um, you bring up a you know point in. Um, about the business model, do you guys have or are you prioritizing um, simulating, you know, more diversity within, you know, the workforce or your current business model to support youth globalization activities? And then also kind of tying it into like the whole startup mission itself. Um, and do you see any like, benefits in, in doing so? Before, when um, we operate face-to-face, um, -face, our workforce is just um, within the geographical location of our business. But now we are open to applicants. And um, we now currently have employees from different parts of the Philippines. We, we don't have, we, we've had applicants from um, different countries, but we've yet to um, uh, learn how to um, uh, to navigate the pro processes of hiring um, from the outside. And um, it's still um, uh, cost-effective hiring from the Philippines. Um, in terms of um, new markets, um, we have, um, well, since we sell digital products and, and marketing consultancy, it's easier for us. We have um, markets in uh, US, Canada, Singapore, and um, Australia. We tried. Um, we tried um, with the China market, but the it's, it's a bit difficult for us because of the language barrier. So we're limiting um, we're limiting our um, services to more English uh, English speaking countries. So language barrier is not uh, much of a problem. How about you, Oscar? I know that you um, are going to like Africa and India. 
and then you're also trying to expand you know the language capabilities of the platform as well in your company yeah absolutely um i mean i'm i'm actually learning hindi right now i use a subscription service called pimsleur and so i try to use it every day but sometimes it doesn't happen but i'm trying to get to a point where i can say at least the basics in hindi um but uh i do think that's important and in that i'd say a quarter of our team are uh are folks from india so Um, we have some employees in Chennai and Mumbai and Jaipur. So um, that's been super important for us. Uh, if we're going to be actually doing business there, it's important that we have representation there as well. Um, and at the end of the day, they're the ones that are on the ground helping us do more business there and expanding. Um, and it's been, I'm trying, we're all trying to have fun with it too. It's uh, totally open this whole world. For me, I've ne I'd never been to Asia before. So even just getting a chance to see how things get done over there, it, it's been such a learning experience for us. Um, and I'm using India as the example because that's really where we've experimented the most. And as, as Remy said earlier, I, I totally, um, you know, last year was all about a one successful pilot. And then from there, it's been just about growing it. Um, but I don't think that, you know, the, globalization for for any company can happen without that that cultural assimilation or that diversity on the team so that is a definite for sure and i would imagine you know since you've got a lot of online content then whatever countries you go into you have to kind of re I, i guess you said you're using a little bit of ai here and there to try to translate some of the learning content so that it is in yes. local languages right Yeah. So how many different languages are your, is your system supporting now? Currently, so our curriculum, the content on our learning portal has um, English, Spanish, and Hindi at the Okay. moment. Um, so far, that's all we need. Um, even for places like Kenya, where we've done some pilots there, English has been okay. Um, but I know that as we continue to work in more countries, there is going to be a need for, for more language languages. So we have used AI and I'm fortunate to have an aunt who's a translator slash interpreter. So she's done a little bit of translation for us on the Spanish side, which has been great. So that's uh, all about being resourceful there. And on Hindi as well, we also have some folks that are helping us there too. So um, I think I just we're posted in the chat. There's a great book called yeah. "Kiss, Bow, or Shake Hands," and I'm not sure if the uh, if you've heard of that book, but it covers a roughly 30 countries. And what it does is it actually explains a lot about their thinking, their communication styles, their deference and authority. Um, you know, don't don't use it necessarily as a line by line and and you know memorize it and and do it, but from a directional perspective, it actually gives you a really great insight into culture. I posted in the chat. It's called "Kiss." bow or shake hands and it's a really wonderful resource Good recommendation. Thank you, Ethan. That, that looks like a read I want to look at. <laughs> um, so we're coming up pretty much on our uh, question and answer time, but I think we have one more open panel general question. So um, Remy, I think you had said, you know, you had very limited success in kind of moving into New York um, with, um, you know, your, your gift bags that included sunglasses that were considered a medical device. But what I wanted to ask is, are there any global markets that any of you have tried to pursue and then either through testing or other means have just determined because of like legal or financial or cultural differences that it just wasn't going to be a, a, a match to continue with? Um, if any of you have any experiences with those, let me, let's talk about those and see what, what kind of findings we have. Um, I can give you an example. When I was at Coty, which is a competition of L'Oreal, it's a big fashion beauty 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 company. Uh, I was in charge of like the expansion to Brazil, and Brazil is the biggest beauty market in the world uh, on uh, many categories. But weirdly enough, most of the biggest players are not playing or are playing in a small extent compared to uh, the rest of the world. Why? Because the protectionism that is a sequel from politic, politi po political uh, decision from Lula, the famous Lula president, basically 
makes almost impossible to sell a, a, an imported product at a normal price. To give an idea, a hundred dollars Chanel fragrance would cost two hundred dollars in Brazil. So, which explains for a lot of brand in my industry, luxury, fashion, cosmetics, that Brazilian are one of the biggest opportunity in travel retail. For example, like if you manage to catch a Brazilian somewhere outside of Brazil, usually they spend way more than than anyone than a lot of other people because in, in their country is difficult. So uh, the reason why Coty as a global company that has a $10 billion, uh, $10 billion revenue, maybe waited decades to enter Brazil is that basically they had to replicate and locally produce all of their top sellers, changing sometimes just one ingredient. I give you an example. What When you talk about a fragrance like CK1, which is one of the biggest and most successful fragrances in the world, you have... The, the fragrance is called Eau de Toilette. You know, it's like a basic perfume. Mm. That is uh, that is uh, uh, taxed more than 100% if you import it to Brazil. But if you add a deodorant ingredient and it's locally produced, the tax, if I remember well, because that was almost 10 years ago, the tax lowers to 7 or 10%. So like yeah. it changes everything. And uh, yeah, the, the only thing I, I want to, but let's go back to everything we've been talking is that even though on paper, numbers show that Brazil is the biggest beauty market in the world, a group like Coty that, that sells $10 billion market waited well decades before they had a robust team and the investment to basically partner with local manufacturing companies to recreate all of the top sellers and adapt them, tropicalize them, as we like to say, to the to the actual market needs and the market legal needs, I would say. Wow, good example. Ethan, Oscar, Omri. Yeah, I was helping a, a company actually get in the U.S. market, and I'll tell you some of the challenges that they had, which was interesting. Um, so they're um, in the agricultural business, uh, agricultural technology, <clears throat> and part part of the issue is actually seasonality, which is basically you can only sell to people really from November to March, like that's the window of opportunity. And so we got them a pilot in the US and that was really, really um, going well and, and still is. But the cost of maintaining the US presence and being able to build because certain customers, especially in their culture sector, they kind of want to be with you for a long time. There, there's an old joke that I remember and it's this guy goes to this conference and in the first year he goes to the conference, he's completely ignored. He tries to go up to a seller and they're just like, get away from me. And the second year, he shows up at the same conference and he goes up to the same seller and the seller says, just go away from me. In the third year, he goes up again and the guy gives him a million dollar order. Hmm. The guy says, I don't understand. And he's like, nobody ever comes the third year. So we just ignore you. <laughs> and then you come the third year, we know that you're actually going to be around. <laughs> and so th that's true of their business too. So um, they're still in the U.S., but they have to take a slightly different approach because it's expensive to operate and maintain in the U.S., and especially a business like theirs will take a long time. Um, you know, the, it, there's a presentation I give, which is 12 things I learned fixing businesses so you don't break yours. One of the things I talk about is everything takes twice as much and three times. Uh, uh, everything takes twice, uh, three times as long and twice as much as you think it's going to take. I think with international expansion, maybe even double that. Now, this is not to, to, to make you afraid. The, the international um, expansion, one done right, is absolutely epic and magical. It's what leads to business empires. It's what leads to unicorns. It's what leads to just really exciting business times and opportunities. But it needs to be smart, and it's fraught with a lot of complexity. And so one of the very specific things that I'd recommend um, and we talked about a lot of things, is get a mentor who's led a company into new international markets. Learn from someone else's mistake so you don't have to make yours uh, at all. Cool. I'm Ray Oscar. Any challenges you might to walk away from in expansion? Uh, I think probably just... I think one lesson that we've experienced recently is not biting off more than you can chew. Um, you know, I mentioned India, Bangladesh, Puerto Rico, and there are a couple other countries. And so we've scaled back and just been just focusing our attention on the U.S. market, which is like our main focus, and then India, just because we've had success expanding there. And then just keeping 
keeping it there because it it it, it is expensive, right? It, it, it there's there's man and woman power involved. There's and there's so many costs that you don't think of initially, um, even the travel alone, right? So you you have to be super calculated and then have a really thought out plan on how you're going to get to the end result, whatever that that may be. Um, And so for us, it's just really been, let's do the U.S. and India really well. And then anything else that comes in, it's okay to maybe have a conversation or entertain it a little bit. But um, I, I would say that that you leave those for when you're actually super successful in both markets and then, then do the rest. Good advice. Amri? Um, yeah, on, on my end, there was a big opportunity in China that... We had to, we had to turn down. Um, it, it was um, really tempting to, to pursue it, but um, we realized that first um, there was a language barrier. It was the most immediate challenge for us. Um, the well, Mandarin, um, the primary language in China, it's it's vastly different from English, not just in terms of vocabulary, but also in syntax and tonality. So it's it's really. difficult and it would be costly for us to employ a uh, bilingual staff or um, so so we uh, then for push for it um, also there's a different um, work expectation um, their work culture is significantly significantly different from from ours and um, we also look at our shared values if the company well even not foreign companies even local companies it's important for us to to have shared values with our partners with our clients um because um if um we have a clash in values it would be different difficult to work with them um in terms of the uh, potential um china client that we let let go um they were they were known for their um, fast pace and speed was very, very much um, important to them sometimes at the expense of quality. And that goes against our um, our values of excellence. So we had to decide to no longer pursue it. Good. I mean, not good from the perspective of a potential opportunity, but that's a good answer from the perspective of being able to evaluate all the the potential impacts and challenges and then make a decision that was going to suit the business rather than staying out there and continuing with something that may not have actually evolved into anything that would have benefited your company in the long run. Um, so I see we've got a couple of uh, attendees left. I think we were we had nine. A few had to drop off because they had to go to other meetings. But um, we will go ahead and open up for any audience questions. Um, if any audience members have a question, they can post it in the chat or the uh, question answer bubble. And we'll try to get to those. We'll leave a little bit of uh, open time here while I chat. But I think, you know, in the end, based on what everyone's saying, you know, is you, you've got to be really calculated about where you're going, what you're trying to achieve, um, how you're going to integrate your values and practices and your culture of your company um with another um or with another offshore organization um to reflect your product and to bring it to market and make sure that you're still in good financial standing after you've done it and that everything meets the right legal requirements um i think you know that's a good summary and know that you know obviously as ethan had mentioned too is doing it all for the right reasons and not for the wrong reason <laughs> um, Because I think, you know, a lot of people, you know, just wanting to get that global at the end of their their company name is probably more of a driver than actually doing something that's going to benefit all parties can, that are involved with it. Um, but cultural language, um, you know, having kind of worked in an operations capability for 32 years um, with a major retailer here in the United States, it was always very eye opening. And obviously, the longer hours it takes, understanding the cultural approach. Sometimes, you know, a, a culture may come across as kind of forceful and adapting to it and not, you know, reacting to it. Um, just understanding that what they want is a little bit of attention and they need some, you know, time or, or help with something and that they're not being rude. Um, but yeah, all those kinds of things come into play. 
Um, I always found it interesting going to Asia, you know, the kind of the territorial histories um, between, you know, invasions that happened before and the attitudes within the Asian cultures against one another, which to me was kind of funny because they all seem very, you know, most um, Asia Pacific countries seem like they're kind of unified around a common collective um, goal of, you know, building and becoming better. And in some cases you would find, you know, Koreans didn't like Japanese or <laughs> Koreans didn't like, you know, Chinese. And so, and that was all based on historical conflicts, you know, so understanding some of those kinds of things can help you understand, you know, how to relate to the different cultures and understanding what business partnerships may actually have a little bit of baggage that goes along with it when you're trying to introduce and um, get two, you know, different branches to interoperate with one another. So um, all of those things came in, you know, even in, factored into some of the offices that we maintained in the various countries abroad. Um, but um, ultimately, everything always would work out. And um, having that face to face, going out, doing those meetings throughout the year, um, to make sure that you had face time with everyone and making sure, you know, that you bridge those differences where they existed and making sure that, you know, everyone was happy and working on the same path, I think was the ultimate goal and objective of what we were trying to accomplish back then. Um, but, uh, so thought, did we get any questions? Well, I have a question. Sure. Um, in thinking, you know, what Ethan said about like finding a mentor, um, do you guys have any suggestions for kind of resources, you know, tools or events or anything of the like where you know people who are first kind of kind of gearing up in that direction can you know get into or you know, do some you know, networking themselves to find you know, those resources um, to be able to think about you know global leadership. Um, I don't know if it, work, it is the case everywhere, but for example, in Mexico and LATAM, and even in the US, a lot of, you know, like if your company is based in some country, like for example, assuming you're French and you have a French company that go to expand somewhere, these, since this interest for uh, government in your local, in domestic market to help you grow in other markets, for example, I know that a lot of embassy or what we call chamber of commerce offers some kind of help for usually a decent price an example in the french case for any company based in france that want to grow into most of the biggest markets this called something this is something called business france which is related to um the embassy the french embassy and i think the mission starts at like 500 euros. Like it's basic information and study. It doesn't mean though that they will cover everything, but for example, like legal part and stuff, they can give you a clear idea on how to start. And um, yeah, that, that can be maybe a, a step I would recommend. And to piggyback off of that, um, often not just your home market, because you described what your home market is, um, there are many resources in the country that you're targeting. So there are sometimes, depending on the market you're going for, there may be aid organizations, there may be startup organizations, um, there may be chambers, and they're all willing to have a conversation with you for free. And in some cases, give you additional resources for free, depending or contacts or things like that. Um, there are obviously books in the subject that I gave you one recommendation that I read that was pretty transformative for me. And the other one is don't underestimate the power of things like meetups, events, and conferences, especially in the market that you're targeting. Um, they can be very specific, so specific industry and niche specific, but they can also be general. The point is time on the ground in a market you're, tar you're covering is invaluable. It doesn't have to be a huge amount of time, but if, if, if you know if, if you're playing towards a market expansion, all the numbers are right, everything looks on paper like it's right. Just spend a week there. Go set up as many meetings. Use LinkedIn. Just tell everyone, I'm a, I'm a humble entrepreneur. I'm considering the market. Will you sit and have coffee with me? Don't underestimate the power of networking. Uh, I'll 
also add to really quickly, um, you know, I'm in Buffalo. I just did a quick search and I don't know these names off the top of my head. Otherwise I would have shared them, but you know, I'm in Buffalo. So I just looked up international shipping, Buffalo world trade. So I found world trade center, Buffalo, Niagara, Buffalo international logistics. A lot of these organizations will usually have like Ethan saying meetups, um, they'll have events. They'll even have free consultations to meet with people who can just give you a lay of the land on what's ahead. Even if it's something as simple as international shipping, which was for us a big deal because we launched on Kickstarter back in 2017 and immediately a quarter of our customers were international. So, you know, for, we were sort of like thrown into it. So we had no choice but to just sort of venture out into the community and figure out, you know, who to talk to. And sometimes one conversation would lead to another that, you know, and it wasn't until then that it would actually be really helpful. But I would say, you know, Start locally, start in your own backyard. Chances are you do have some resources available to you there. Excellent. If you're also interested to expand or invest in the in the Philippines or maybe consider outsourcing some of your um, some of your um, services for cost efficiency, um, we have the Philippine LGBT Chamber of Commerce. We're building a supplier directory. Um, you can re reach out to me directly um, so we can see if there would be a, a fit with um, our um, LGBT business owners. We are also, um, we can also refer entrepreneurs, micro entrepreneurs um, from Go Negocio. It's under the Department of Trade and Industry. So across the Philippines, there are a lot of um, small businesses, suppliers who are also looking for um, new markets abroad. So if you would like to explore that kind of partnership, then um, feel free to get in touch. Thank you, Omri. I think we're about at the end. I think we're, we're, we're about 10 minutes over. So um, since I don't see any questions, um, I think, we will. I yes, think go so ahead. Paul. Saul has a question. Do, do any of the speakers have a background or experience with e-commerce? That's the question. I, I do. My business is an e-commerce business. Or and clothing and manufacturing. <laughs> I was in the global supply chains for about two years, specifically supplying technologies to clothing manufacturers all around the world. Saul, does that answer your question? Pitfalls for new folks. Can you be a little more specific? Because I could go in any direction with pitfalls. <laughs> he can only type so fast. So um, he's asking, were there any pitfalls in e-commerce? I guess. Well, uh, I think he's, he's um... or looking for suppliers, OK. Okay, so I know where you want to go because I was going to say e-commerce is all about community and engagement. Um, yeah, I mean that that's that's a converse, that's a conversation maybe for an entire another um, panel for looking for suppliers. Um, I don't know enough about what your business is doing. There's a lot of print on demand, for instance, resources now, depending on how to get started. If you're really looking at a uh, longer term um, partnership looking to white label and rebrand pantyhose i mean because it's a, a specific product there are only a couple countries that actually do that um so at least it narrows down your search i know that colombia does it and i'm pretty sure bangladesh and indonesia do it um I, the way that i've usually done things like that unfortunately i can't help you because i'm too far away removed it's been about seven years but you need a local person so basically you need to reach out to your network and find someone who's done that and what will usually happen it probably take a couple of weeks and i'll just explain to you generally how this works right so you're going to reach out on linkedin to other networks anybody that knows clothing manufacturers someone's going to connect yeah. you to this next person who's going to connect you to the person's brother and eventually you'll get to a contact um that's generally how it's done i i find the personal relationships and contacts are the ones that are better to be trusted especially when you're trusting a supplier for your major business Remy probably has some also experience in general uh, in terms of sourcing suppliers, maybe tricks of the trade for just getting started. You know what? I mean, every partners I found, either like I, I mean, so I'm, I'm, I don't know what is a panty or I don't know what it means. It doesn't, it's not in my, I don't like know what it means. Stocking, stockings or leggings. Ah, or stocking. 
Um, that's not a category I know. What I know is that you can find a lot of lot of information um, online just googling. Uh, some company like Patagonia, like Everlane, like Italic, that are huge benchmark for me. Actually, disclose everything about the manufacturing. Yeah, company. that's right. In the, in their year end report, in their stock end report, they'll yeah. actually disclose all the. And uh, that's something I actually do as well. On my website, you'll find I disclose everything, cost margin, vendors. I disclose everything because I do believe in radical transparency in fashion um, and cosmetics. Uh, so yeah, I would only look at your favorite competitors and your favorite products on the market and see and understand where they produce because either the factory disclose it. Sometimes also like you have a lot of Instagrammers that actually focus on that and they give you everything about every, everything. Like they show all the manufacturing and stuff about any brand. And or I would look to websites uh, about like transparent companies that shares uh, where they produce. And Mexico, I think, is a great part. Like any fashion-related product, like Patagonia produces everything in Mexico. Especially, you know, if you are in the US, nearshoring is definitely something that is relevant today and will be tomorrow as well. So I would look at LATAM in Mexico. Maybe there is option, but I don't know that category that well. You're welcome. Awesome. Well, it looks like we're at the end of our event. So I just want to say thank you to... Uh, all of the amazing panelists that are here today and can, made a contribution to this amazing, much needed discussion. And thank you to all of everybody who has showed up. I am putting a link to my LinkedIn. Uh, we are always looking for volunteers and potential speakers for our growth stage programming board. So if you're interested, you can reach out to me directly and we can have a conversation. Other than that, thank you to everybody for participating and thank you to the to the moderators as well. I hope you all have a great evening and we are done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you.